From inside the castle in Owings Mills, Maryland, it is the Banner Ravens podcast. Paul Mancano, Jonas Schaefer. Jonas, do you like me going with the castle this time instead of uh, Ravens practice facility? What do you prefer? <laughs> it's more colloquial. I like yeah, it. It's like it's like you know what you're talking about. Thank you. Camden Yard, some people call it Opassi. Some people don't like Opassi. Who calls it Opassi? Some people call it Opassi. When I first started uh, in Baltimore, People were calling it Opassi, and then people outside of Baltimore or in Baltimore were like, "People outside of Baltimore don't call it that." So, are these people you trust? <laughs> Not with my life, but <laughs> in general, yes. Uh, on today's show, we're going to talk defense, Jonas. We are almost a week away from day one of the NFL draft, and so uh, we've gone a lot offense in the last couple of weeks. We've talked about wide receivers, we've talked about quarterbacks, running backs, offensive linemen. Today, we're going to be talking about the edge rushers, the inside linebackers, the cornerbacks, the safeties, all the position groups on that side of the football, because, uh, boy, we got really cram in some uh, some talk here before the draft. And by the way, if you're listening to this, uh, give us a like, a thumbs up, write us a good review. I will read it out here on the podcast if you write us a good review. Five stars as well. Anywhere that you're listening to the Banner Ravens podcast. Uh, all right, Jonas. Today, we are here for Ravens workouts. Do you expect to learn anything uh, enlightening at today's workouts? No, I, I want to know uh, what free crab cakes for life means. Really entails from Derek. Yeah, Henry. yeah, because, uh, you know, we both went to college, not to brag, but uh, <laughs> flex, <laughs> you know, the, the, all those promotions at basketball games where it's like you hit a shot, you get free pizza for college. Didn't you say that you won one of those one time? no okay did you compete for it though no because i was never selected oh okay i thought you you had in a previous podcast yeah but like i mean derrick henry doesn't need the free crack picks for life i don't think he's going to take jimmy's up on on their offer but does it mean like one crab cake every week for three years is that free crab picks for life yeah i mean i i assume you can't just sit down on like a monday and say give me all of your crab cakes and like take some home no yeah no and also and just you like might put them in a giant freezer and save them for your life it's good it's good promo because i mean derrick henry would love to have him would love to see him in baltimore for two years but it's possible he's here for only the one and yeah. he lives in texas so i don't <laughs> know if there's a lot of jimmy's franchises out there in the greater probably not dfw area so do you think it's a contractual thing do you think he signs on the dotted line that says specifically how these crab cakes are going to be doled out it's a good question i don't know enough about crab cake preparation also free crab cakes for life does that include the crab cake sandwich like if you or is it just the crab cakes not much of a seafood guy paul these are all the questions we're going to be asking derrick henry <laughs> uh when he comes to the podium these are the important questions uh yeah we're going to hear from a few players today roquan tyler linderbaum not lamar jackson unfortunately yeah uh but hopefully we'll get an idea it's, it's insane how early these things start and then, i mean it's draft hasn't even happened yet we already have some uh, voluntary workouts all right, Jonas, shall we get into the defensive players Defense. Yep, let's in this do it. draft? You know, I was putting together a, a little mock draft yesterday, a 32-pick mock draft, just first round. And uh, the first 10 or 12 picks were offensive players in the draft that I was putting together. Now, maybe the Atlanta Falcons, we were saying this morning, will go defense. But it is going to be so incredibly offensive heavy in the first round of this draft that maybe some quality defensive players will slip all the way to 30 guys that maybe would be considered top 20, top 15 players in another year's draft. Yeah. Uh, I still think the odds are that they're going to look for offense. I agree because of the depth of talent at offensive line <clears throat> at wide receiver. Um, but you know, you see Kool-Aid McKinstry, Alabama cornerback mock to the Ravens at 30, uh, you see, you know, Darius Love Robinson that. mocked to the Ravens, uh, you know, Missouri defense alliance slash edge rusher. A lot of guys who, who might be in the mix for the Ravens on the defensive side. And uh, I, I think Zach Orr would probably love that. That would be a, a very nice uh, your hired gift. Um, but probably offensive line. Yeah, I think that's what we're looking at right now. Yeah, offensive line is is still our focus. And I, I think it's probably still Eric DaCosta's focus. He said that's where they've spent a lot of their time. But he also qualified that by saying it's because of the quality of players at that position in this draft. It is very strong in offensive lines, very strong in wide receiver. The Ravens had the best defense in football, most likely last year, if you look at 
you know, most statistical uh, measurements. However, they did lose a lot of talent. I mean, you know, they lost Patrick Queen to the Steelers. They lost Ronald Darby. They lost a lot of their depth uh, on the defensive side of the football. So they're going to have to draft defensive players in this draft. It's not going to be all offense. And like you said, it may not be first round, but we're going to dive deep into maybe some depth picks that the Ravens could make, especially on day two and day three. Uh, let's start with the edge rushers, Jonas. This is a draft class in terms of the edge rushers that Eric DaCosta said, quote, it's an average draft for edge pass rushers. It depends on what you're looking for. Certainly some guys at the top that probably won't be there. We'll touch on who those guys are when we pick. So the challenge is getting in the range of 25th to 45th players that we have a chance to get at either 30 or 62. What do you think of this overall draft class when it comes to edge rushers? It's it's fine. Um, <laughs> Average. Yeah. I, I mean, like, you know, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at day three edge prospects because You're those guys to the grind. <laughs> no. Th those guys tend to not do a whole lot. I mean, the, the Ravens, yeah. as Eric DaCosta mentioned last week, have done a good job finding guys on day three who turn into really good players. Matthew Judon, Zadarius Smith. You know that th they've done a good job at finding diamonds in the rough, um, but it's it's a it's a tough business. I mean, for you know, sometimes you find a Matthew Judon, sometimes you find a Dalen Hayes. You know, th th these guys are available in the fourth, fifth round for a reason: injuries, athleticism, lack of production, what have you. So uh, it will be interesting to see what the Ravens' plan is if they don't come out of day one or day two with an edge rusher, because. At that point, you're kind of playing with fire. You're, you're basically saying we're confident to get a Tavius Robinson type, someone who's probably never going to be a star in this league. But, you know, the Ravens have, they've invested well enough at that position where I think you can probably get away with that for another year or so. You can rely on Adafi Owe to maybe take the next step. You can maybe hope that David Ajabo stays healthy gets bendy, gets healthy, does everything he needs to do. And then, you know, you, you just rely on the infrastructure and the talent elsewhere to to do what they need to. But if if they don't find someone that they like on day two or day three, uh, or, or on round two or round three, then it's it's probably fair to assume that they won't be making much of an impact unless you're talking special teams year one. That's my off-season goal is to get bendy as well. <laughs> get much more flexible this off-season. Maybe be able to touch my toes. That'd be a nice off-season goal. I haven't done that since I was like... 13 maybe. maybe you and i can get bendy this i'm, I'm not gonna stretch with you Paul. <laughs> darn it all right well they have a lot of production to replace at that position yep. i mean maybe maybe if you cobble together the group that they have and you cross your fingers and like you said hope for some improvements internally you could convince yourself but I, i'm of the opinion that they need to add at edge rusher and they ideally need to add through the draft because i think this is just as much a long-term need as it is a short-term need because david ojabo is is and one more injury away, essentially, from the Ravens, unfortunately, probably have, having to give up on him, mm -hmm. just given how little he has played in his first two years in the league. Adafi Owe, still immense talent, still first-round talent, and he has shown flashes of that, but has never had more than five sacks in a season. Jadavion Clowney played 57% of defensive snaps last year. I know they brought back Kyle Van Noy, but he's 33 and had a career year last year that you don't know is going to be repeatable. Other than that, you are really in need of some ways to get to the quarterback that is not Justin Matabike. You need some pressure around the edge. And, and this is a defensive scheme that under Mike McDonald and probably under Zach Orr doesn't rely on superstar talent on the edge because of how many different ways they were able to scheme up pressure last year. However, if you're looking at the future of this team, Odafe Owe, they have a fifth-year option decision to make on him. So he's obviously going to be here for the 2024 season. I think they're going to pick up his option. If they don't, he's gone after the 2024 season. He's at least testing free agency. Even if they do pick up his option, that's only two years that you have him in-house. And Kyle Van Noy signed him to a two-year deal. But like I mentioned, with the age, there's a lot of question marks at edge rusher going forward. Are there certain guys in this draft? We, we're assuming that Florida State's Jared Verst, Alabama's Dallas Turner, two guys that I think are probably going to be off the board by the time the Ravens pick. Are there any guys in the next tier that you think might be worth taking at number 30? Well, I don't think 
he's going to make it to 30, but I, I would be, it would be interesting to see where on the Ravens big board chop Robinson would fall. Yeah. We've talked a lot about him a lot on this podcast. Yeah. Maryland guy started his career at Maryland, entered the transfer portal uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I think the initial reporting was that he was looking to go and get a bag at USC. That did not happen. He ended up at Penn state. Uh, never really fully developed into the, the sack artist that, you know, you thought he would be only nine and a half sacks these past two years at Penn state, mm-hmm. uh, but graded out really well, uh, you know, on, on PFF, uh, 20.9% pass rush win, win rate, 13th highest in college football last year. And then athletically just, you know, the, the kind of quintessential Penn state prospect just totally freakish 97th percentile, 40, 97th percentile, 10 yard split, 95th percentile broad jump. So extremely explosive that shows up on tape. His first step is incredible, but he just wasn't able to translate that into reliable sack production. Like a lot of guys in this class. So see you off away. It feels like a very similar conversation. Well, it isn't. It isn't because I think Adafi's problem was he didn't have that good first step. Like he had an incredible forty, mm-hmm. but he was always like the last person off the off the snap. Chop is the first one reacting to, to the ball. He just couldn't, for whatever reason, get to the quarterback. And you know, some people say he has a good pass rush plan. Some people will say he has a nice arsenal of moves. But if he did, if they're right, it didn't really convey to a lot of sacks. But you know, he has two of the most important things that a pass rusher, you know, needs to have to be a alpha at the position, which is a good first step mm-hmm. and good bend. You know, you want to, if you can, the closer you are to Von Miller, the easier it is, the better chances you're going to have of being just a downright stud. And he's got a couple of those traits. Um, if all he needs is, you know, a year with a really good teacher, hey, man, Baltimore's got Chuck Smith. Look right. what he did with, you know, JD, you know, JD with 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 Matt Abike, with Adafe. Uh, so many guys last year had probably their best year ever. And a lot of that was because of Chuck Smith. So, um, you know, you read up on Chop Robinson and you see NFL guys talking anonymously about how you know, if he'd come back for another year, got even better, became a 10 sec, 12 sec guy at Penn State, maybe he'd be a top 10 pick. So it's it's not out of the realm of possibility that this guy turns into the best pass rusher in this class because of that. I don't think he's going to make it to 30, but if he somehow falls in the way in unexpected falls happen, you know, we didn't expect Kyle Hamilton to be on the board at what pick 14 a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, you, you wonder, you know, if it's a Sophie's choice situation where it's like him on the board, Jordan Morgan on the board, uh, Tyler Guyton on the board. Do they say we can find another tackle in round two in round three? There are only so many chop Robinsons in this universe. We're going we're gonna to take him, bet on him, bet that whatever deficiencies he has of run as a run defender are overweighed by the fact that this guy could be really, really special as an edge rusher. One guy that I really like that I think could be really special as an edge rusher in this draft, that's UCLA's Liatu Latu, who I also don't think is going to make it to 30th overall, but he's the kind of player who could slide because of his questionable medical history. He uh initially had to medically retire and then transfer to UCLA put up incredible numbers the last couple of years. Another guy that I think, like I said, is probably going to go maybe 20th at the latest, but would you trade up for him? The question is would do, would the Ravens make any kind of trades trade ups, you know, would, would there be anybody that they would think would be worthy of doing that? Because they really only trade up. Lamar Jackson is really the only one we could think of the last big trade up that they made in the first round. Because it just makes sense to trade back long term. It is a stable franchise, and that's how you amass draft capital. That is how you stay stable and stay drafting good players for a long time. However, there are some guys that I think might be worth it. And Liatu Latu, if he passes your medicals, but other teams are iffy on him and he's slipping, I don't know. Ravens have a lot of picks to play with in this draft. Might as well use some to to go up and get a, a guy that you think could be a stalwart at an important position. Yeah, I think I'd feel more comfortable about it if he didn't have the medical situation. Yeah. If, if that neck injury weren't just a, a glaring red flag. And, you know, it's possible that this is overblown and like 25 of 32 teams said that he's draftable because our doctors checked him out and said it's right. fine. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think losing like a third round pick to move up eight spots or whatever and get a guy who 
you know, maybe has a freak play in preseason and never plays it down for you because he's fearful for his long-term health, that would just be a total disaster sure. and not something that the Ravens can afford to do at, at this point. And not their MO. But yeah. but Latu reminds me a little bit of Jalen Phillips from a couple of years ago who the Dolphins drafted, who met, had to medically retire, I believe, from UCLA and yep. then transferred to Miami. And uh, he has had a good career so far, but had a season-ending injury last year. So another guy that uh, that compares favorably there. All right. So anybody other than day one targets, any day two, day three targets that stick out to you at edge rusher? Well, I, I just think that if they don't get someone that they really, really like in day one or day two, I, I think there are only so many like high ceiling guys that you can find on day three. Um, the guy that I stumbled upon when I was doing some research for the draft and who I included in my mock draft that went up on Monday was uh, on the Baltimore banner.com where you can subscribe $1 for six months. Houston Christian. Okay. Do you do, do you know that school? It used to be Houston Baptist. <laughs> I've heard of it. Yeah. FCS school. Uh they have a they had a edge rusher named Jalix Hunt. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Elite name. J A L Y X. Started his career as a safety at Cornell. <laughs> transferred. Went to Houston Christian. Got beefed up, put on like 40 or 50 pounds. Also an off-season goal of mine. <laughs> and uh, was, I think, the conference's defensive player of the year. Um, really athletic. Uh, you know, obviously looks a little bit out of place at times because of that safety-ish body that he has. But mm -hmm. if you're talking about a guy that you want to get in the building because you believe in his long-term potentially because you believe that he can be a diamond in the rough, then I think that's the kind of guy you maybe spend a, a fifth-round pick on, maybe a fourth, depending on, on on if you really, really like him and think that he might go earlier than than is projected. But, yeah, I mean, like there, there are only so many guys in this fourth, fifth, sixth-round range who I, I think you can bank on being impact contributors, you know, in year one or year two. So what's, you know, war chest of picks to, to spend one on? The safety to edge rusher pipeline is uh, not particularly fruitful. Usually you see maybe safeties to linebackers. linebackers. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever heard of a safety going to, but sometimes it works. You never know. Uh, one guy that Kyle I have. Kyle Hamilton. Kyle Hamilton can play everything. He can do everything. <laughs> uh, the one guy that I have uh, on maybe a day two, day three, I'm thinking maybe third round pick based on what I've seen is Western Michigan's Marshawn Neeland. And I've heard him mentioned with the Ravens several times uh, just from outsiders perspective saying this would be a good fit uh, four and a half sacks last year uh, former high school tight end so the tight end to edge rusher pipeline could be alive and well um, you know the question is how would he fit in this defense and I think he's the kind of guy that uh, he has enough athleticism that he would be able to stuff the run he would be able to get to the quarterback all right Jonas let's get to cornerback in this year's draft Another position that uh, the Ravens don't need a starter at this spot. They have their their top two guys set. However, they could use some depth at cornerback, and the place to get it would probably be day three, maybe a third round pick, late day two in this draft. Yeah, I mean it's it's a cornerback room that looks good until maybe you scrutinize it a little bit closer because. Marlon Humphrey, I know there's a, a lot of unhappiness about how he played last year. And you know, you hear you hear him talk on his podcast. He never really got healthy last year. He had that preseason foot injury mm -hmm. as one thing after another. I don't know. I guess it depends on just your your outlook on life, whether that means that you were feeling good that that was an aberration, just a, a weird year where he never got healthy, or maybe it's a little bit of a warning sign that's sure. You know, you play football long enough, these injuries type to tend to accrue. And maybe this is just the kind of beginning of a long downslope in the way that Ronnie Stanley, yeah, one injury after another led to a point where he was just not in the Ravens' long term plans. You hope not because they have quite a lot of money tied up, to, but similar to Ronnie Stanley, they have quite a lot of money tied up to Marlon Humphrey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're counting on him being, being the dude in that group. Uh, Brandon Stevens entering the last of, uh, yes, year, last year of his, of his deal. You know, we could, uh, we could fast forward a week uh, uh, at a time and, you know, he signed a long-term contract. I'm just seeing that being a long-term. I mean, I, I just can't see with the breakout year he had last year. I can't see the Ravens letting him test free agency. I don't know though. Arthur Mallette in the slot, just, you know, resigned for a two-year deal, I believe, but he turns 31 in July. Wasn't really considered 
uh, that, you know, high pedigree of a guy when they brought him in, obviously he turned out to be great, but yeah, who knows how much that was the Mike McDonald effect, who knows how much of that was just him kind of rediscovering what he was earlier in his career. And then behind them, I mean, you know, Jalen Armour Davis, Pepe Williams, they were brought in to be the depth guys, maybe potential starters at some point, but they just haven't shown us much over over the past two years. Injuries have been a big, big obstacle for them. Jalen Armour Davis dealing with concussions, Pepe Williams dealing with lower body stuff. So um, you're hopeful that they're able to turn the corner and get right, you know, from from Instagram and social media, it seems like Jalen Armour Davis has been putting in a lot of work this this offseason to to get healthy. But if, if it's a brain injury, man, there's there's not a whole lot that you can do to to kind of get over that. So I'm hopeful that both those guys are are in good shape because the Ravens need them for defense. They need them for special teams. They need them to just help them get past this injury bugaboo that that always yeah. kinds to always tends to, to find them. And Eric DaCosta said of this year's draft class when it comes to cornerbacks, if we have a chance to draft a corner this year, you can count on us doing that. I tend to buy that in the Liars lunch. I think that they probably will, but also best player available. If somebody's not there, they're not going to take them. Guys that are not going to get to the Ravens at 30. Terry and Arnold, Toledo's Quinion Mitchell, uh, Cooper DeGene, probably not going to get there. And even if he does, I think it'd be an awesome test for Zach Orr to figure out how to work that guy in as maybe a slot corner, maybe a safety as a, you know, hybrid type player there, but I don't think they're going there. And then skinny as a beanpole, <laughs> Nate, Nate Wiggins from Clemson. That concerns the heck out of me. He's like 185 soaking wet. Uh, he is really skinny. Uh, Kool-Aid McKinstry, you mentioned him coming up in a mock draft. Do you like that pick? I've I've crunched the tape, Jonas, and you know that I'm never wrong on any of these prospects. I wasn't wild about what I saw from Kool-Aid. What didn't you like about Kool-Aid? He, I mean, he, he at Alabama going up against some tough matchups, but he tended to get beat quite a lot. Okay, that's it. <laughs> that, that settles it. Moving on. No, no, no. Uh, I, 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 I'm I'm looking. I'm gonna be doing a story on him for tomorrow. Just digging into the tape and are you including my analysis nope i will not be unless you're willing to be an anonymous nfl gm <laughs> uh first of all we should say the most important fact why kool-aid because as a baby his smile reminded his grandma because of the he loved man <laughs> he loved pork chops <laughs> he also got a, an nil deal with kool-aid so that that's good for him hopefully uh like with caitlin clark he continued to can continue to make that money in the nfl even sure. after he leaves college uh but you know he he is very very close athletically to marlon humphrey um at least in terms of height weight arm length like you know an, like a half inch a pound off from for marlon a lot of those obviously he's not the athlete that marlon was that was why marlon went as high as he did um probably didn't have you know that kind of projection uh the the, the, the trajectory that marlon's career started to have at alabama where he was just a, a pretty quick success story there um I think there were, the big concern with him is the deep speed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he got beat a couple times at Alabama over the top. He maybe assuaged some of those concerns running a four four seven forty at Alabama's pro day. Not elite, you know, but fine. And, and we've seen the Ravens, you know, turn really good defensive backs uh, without great speed. You know, just think of all the safeties they've had who have not been especially burners. Um, you know. Marcus Williams, I know we're talking about different different position here, but Marcus right. Williams, not a speed guy. Chuck Clark, not a speed guy. Marlon Humphrey, or excuse me, uh, Kyle Hamilton, not a speed guy, but they know how to play. They're, yeah. they're, they're versatile. They're smart. They get hands on balls. And I think that's that's the the reputation that Kool-Aid has, is, is he is a fluid guy, scheme versatile, intelligent, can fit in just about any scheme. Uh, probably won't make it out of the first round. So if the Ravens... Yeah have him on the board at number 30 and there's not a whole lot of other options there and, and they feel like we want to continue to bolster this this wide receiver room considering the talent that's in the afc north it might it might make sense uh but also you know there probably will be you know offensive lineman on the board at that point so yeah. you get you got to you know value what you uh what you what, what matters more uh, most to you and in terms of day two day three guys uh name i keep hearing pop up is ruckers max melton yep uh, he feels like he is flying up draft boards. Is there one guy you would stake your claim to? Looking at cornerback tape is so boring. Uh, I really just <laughs> look, if look he's at good, the YouTube. He's not getting thrown at. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the the guy who I think probably won't make it to the Ravens in that uh, round two range because they are picking as late as, late as they are. Number 62 is uh, Mikey Sainer still out of Michigan. 
just really flashed in that national championship game. But his ball production last year was great. Six picks, returned two of them for touchdowns. He's close with Isaiah Likely. They played at the same high school. They actually went on IG Live together the other uh, the other day, just you know, randomly. Um, but he is the kind of prototypical slot corner. Um, so you know, maybe if he, if he was as productive as he was last year on the outside, we'd probably be talking about a first round pick. But we we know just how important slot cornerbacks are to the NFL nowadays, with everyone you know running these three wide receiver sets. Um, but he is special teams experience, good run defender. His nickname growing up was Sweetness. I don't think you, you can overlook that. Like I said, he probably won't be available at 62. He might be, you know, it's, it's hard to see him making it out of the 40s undrafted just because of how well he did last year and how well he profiles athletically and as a just intangible guy. But he, he's a guy who, if he falls to the Ravens or maybe they move around the board in some creative way, I think he would make a lot of sense for them. All right. Another defensive back position, safety. We touched on, uh, you know, how much the Ravens could use some depth at cornerback. I think the same goes for safety because they lost Geno Stone to a division rival this uh, free agency. Uh, they have Marcus Williams. They have Kyle Hamilton entrenched there. Marcus Williams struggled with injuries last year, played through a torn pec for most of the season. They could use maybe a long-term lottery chip at safety to try to develop slowly behind both of those guys. Um Anybody in this class that you think uh, would make sense for the Ravens? I don't think there's any chance there. There's any way the Ravens go with a safety in round one, but maybe later on in this draft. Yeah, I think round three to, to round five is probably the sweet spot for them because you need, I, I think, to get a guy who frees up Kyle Hamilton to do Kyle Hamilton things. You know, yeah. we expect this defense not to change a whole lot structurally in, in making that transition from like Mike McDonald to Zach or so we're going to see Kyle Hamilton in the box. We're going to see him in the slot. We're going to see him lining up, you know, at edge rusher at certain spots. And that means that you need another safety back there to pair with Marcus Williams. Maybe you need two because you are still maybe concerned about Marcus Williams, just durability and being in being the, you know, a guy who could be an every day, every down guy. So uh, I think it would make sense for the Ravens to, to find a guy that they like who can play that deep safety role, but probably more likely play that box safety role, you know, be the, the Geno Stone type, you don't have to have great range. Right. Just come in, cover tight ends, uh, you know, come take, downhill. take down running backs. Yeah, come downhill. Uh, Geno, for as wonderful a player as he was last year, wasn't that great of a tackler. I think that's a, a spot where the Ravens could maybe look to focus on skill-wise. You, know, you, you think of the kind of troubles that Geno had tackling uh, running backs, the, the trouble he had tackling David Njoku in that Lost in Baltimore against Cleveland. Right. Um, you know, I got a guy who I mocked to the Ravens in the fourth or fifth round, I think, Malik Mustafa out of Wake Forest. You know, again, he's not going to be a day one pick, not going to be a day two pick because he just doesn't have these athletic traits that, that make him special. But he was super productive at Wake Forest, played on special teams, lined up everywhere. I, I think you want that versatility, or at least someone who could be versatile in the system so that you could be the kind of defense that changes the picture pre-snap to post-snap and just continues to do a follow quarterbacks the way the Ravens did yeah. the last year. All right. Inside linebacker. We know they have Roquan Smith as their hundred million dollar man there. Trenton Simpson from all accounts is going to be their starting safe or their starting inside linebacker next to him. And Eric DaCosta said uh, in his liars lunch him that he thinks Trenton Simpson is as good as any inside linebacker in this year's draft. And he was a third round pick last year. Tells you a lot about what they think of him internally, but it also says a lot about this draft in terms of inside linebackers. I don't think we're going to see, maybe we'll see one inside linebacker taken on day one. Probably not, though. Uh, there are a couple guys, though, that maybe get to second, third, fourth round that the Ravens will take a, a shot on. Uh, you think of uh, Edron Cooper from Texas A&M, uh, Junior Colson from Michigan. Peyton think, Wilson, NC State. Yeah. Do you think that uh, who has also had injury concerns, I believe? Yeah. So maybe he falls. Are there, do you think the Ravens, any chance the Ravens take a guy on day two, or do you think they really just save that for the last uh, couple of days? I think it would have to be like a glaring, glaring case of yeah. best player available. Like maybe they have Junior Colson rated as the the number 40 player on the board. Again, a Michigan guy. So he has that experience with the system. He's young, so he's projectable. And it's the, it's the end of the third round. There's no one that they really like as much as him. And they take him and they say, hey, right. you're going to compete with, with Trenton Simpson for this job. Wouldn't be great roster building, but again, you know, that's how the Ravens do business. And I just think at this point, if you believe in Roquan Smith, as you should, and you believe in Trenton Simpson, as it seems the Ravens do, 
you are just looking for guys who can build out that depth. I think Malik Harrison is a great, great depth piece. Mm -hmm. I think you know he can play on the outside, can play on the inside, can play special teams. I don't think there's anyone in the draft who could deliver the kind of impact in 2024 that Malik Harrison probably will to the Ravens. But you 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 know with special teams importance being emphasized uh, by these rule changes, I think you need to fill out that side of the ball. You need to get guys who are athletic enough to come in day one you know maybe day 100 uh, and be contributors to special teams get up and down a punt return kick return just you know be the kind of guys that john harbaugh really likes to have in this building because they're low maintenance they go out there do their job give this team an edge on uh, give this team an edge on special teams don't really make a lot of money in, in, the, in the long term because they're not playing a lot of defense but fundamental uh, i think to yeah. the Ravens' success over the past decade and maybe give them an edger in yeah especially uh Defensive line. This is a position that really the Ravens, if they were to go through this entire draft and not draft anybody on defensive line, if unless it's like a defensive end who can rush the passer and they feel like he can fit their scheme, I feel like they would be okay with at that point. Um, they are pretty deep when it comes to the defensive line right now. They obviously extend Justin Matabike. He is expected to be in the middle of that defensive line for quite a while. They have uh, Brent Urban, Travis Jones, Michael Pierce, who they also extended right before the end of the season. Maybe some day three guys. They like to take defensive linemen and guys who can fit their scheme. Uh, guys who are not going to make it to them. Texas is Byron Murphy. The question is, Illinois' Johnny Newton. Would he slip all the way to 30? And if he did, would he be worth a first-round pick? I think he might be. I mean, you know, you you, you Google Johnny Newton or Jerzon Newton Jerzon, as his yeah. given name. Uh, there are some people who feel like he's one of the best defensive players in this draft. I mean, the production speaks for itself at Illinois. He led FBS interior defensive linemen with 103 quarterback pressures over the past two years. That is the most uh, in that span, according to PFF. So he has that production. He's athletic. He's actually uh, surprisingly a former Maryland commit. Uh, I think the that what happened there was Michael Oxley didn't check in on him as Ooh. much as he should have. And he, he flipped his commitment to Illinois That's a right before signing day. So uh, sorry about that locks, especially because he also had chop Robinson. So two first round yeah. guys that maybe could have helped the Terps uh, be more than a middle of the <laughs> big, big 10 team. You're not bitter. I can tell. Um, but you know, the, the, there are scenarios where he, maybe he falls because maybe he gets past a certain point in the mid, you know, in the teens or the early twenties and, the teams that are drafting there already have pretty good defensive linemen or they you know have concerns about him for size concerns or whatever and and maybe he falls to the ravens at 30. you know i, I think you you do enough pff mock draft simulations and there are some really interesting guys there on, on the board at number 30 and johnny newton has been one of them i don't think he's going to make it uh, i think it's probably like a five or ten percent chance that he falls to 30 but he's another guy like with chop robinson where Maybe it's it's him versus Kingsley Suamatia versus Jordan Morgan versus Tyler Guyton, and you really have a tough decision to make because, yes, you already have just you know just Matabike. This is another three tech. That you yeah. only have so many spots on that defensive line just geometrically to fit a guy like that. But if it's best player available and you you believe in your your staff and their ability to find answers for too much talent, I think you, that's a, that's the kind of problem that you'd like to have. The Ravens have obviously built a stable franchise by taking best player available. But here's the thing. You need two offensive tackles in 2025, <laughs> most likely. Let's be honest. And that's an incredibly important position. I just think you're going to tend to lean on the offensive line if you have a chance to. Yep. Uh, Florida State's Braden Fisk is another guy. Clemson's Rook uh, is, uh, oh boy, how are we going to pronounce this? Are you going to give it a try? It's, it's, no, it's, no, no, it's there on the no, dock. I'm not going to. I'm going to go. Rook, oh, row, row, row. <laughs> Your boat. What, what 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 I what I heard uh, it, it that sounds like is uh, like a a dog licking uh, peanut butter like wow uh, that's who would ever think uh, of that not me some linguists all right uh, Ohio State's Michael Hall Jr. Michigan's Chris Jenkins who's the son of Chris Jenkins uh, there's another guy who might be falling down draft boards to Bondre Sweat. Uh, from, te from Texas because uh, two weeks before the draft, he gets a DUI. And uh, there were already some red flags on him coming into this process. And it seems like none of those questions uh, have really been answered here. Yeah, I, mean, I think the maybe something we'll address next week is just, are the Ravens in a spot 
considering everything that happened with Zay Flowers, and again, yeah. nothing's happened with mm -hmm. Zay Flowers. We should be careful to, to to point that out. Will they take any kind of gambles on guys at positions of need? Obviously, to its line, not a position of need, but but there is a possibility where maybe the Ravens have ignored wide receiver on day one. They've ignored wide receiver on day two, and they are there in the fourth round and Jermaine Burton at Alabama, a guy with a bit of a reputation for not being the the best dude in the locker room, uh, not the most accommodating yeah. uh, host to fans storming on the field and potentially smacking fans as they celebrate an Alabama loss. Uh, would, would they be interested in someone like him? You know, PFF, I think, has him as a, a second-round talent, and he's been productive at Alabama. But do the Ravens, are they in a spot now in their championship window where they want to take a risk when they want to take a gamble on a guy who might not be the best locker room fit because you yeah. believe in this culture you believe in this locker room you believe in the leadership of guys like roquan smith tyler linderbaum lamar jackson Derek henry where they can get this guy where he's not an issue and you believe that you're going to win enough where you know any discontent yeah. does not really crop up so i still think the ravens probably lean in the direction of we like guys who know their place and who aren't going to be just total headaches for our coaching staff. But it is interesting because, because there are some guys who, who could fall in this draft and maybe present some pretty good value for the Ravens. Yeah. Well, we have a uh, little more than a week to figure out and to determine who the Ravens might draft in the 2024 NFL draft. And next week on the banner Ravens podcast, we will have a mock draft, a seven round mock draft of the Baltimore Ravens. Should we do seven? <laughs> seven let's might get, be a little let's bit. Let's do seven. Why not? Who's your who's your favorite seventh round wide receiver we'll, prospect? We'll see who's on the board. At oh, seventh, you're not going to give away your big board. I'm not going to give away my big board. Are you kidding me? I'm working on it. Uh, this is going to be collaborative, by the way. <laughs> we can't do we, we can't each do then a I'll seventh round mock draft. Then I'll take over. All right. You think Eric Costa knows all the seventh round guys right now? I think he does. I think he probably does. But you know, maybe he knows them a little bit less than some other guys in that front office. That'll be my role, Jonas. Let me let me take. You're just going to pick the guy with the cool name. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going to say that guy. Uh, we will have a mock draft for you coming next week. So please tune into that. And on draft night, we will have a live draft show for the Ravens. Number 30 overall pick. Let's hope that they just don't trade out of the first round and, and make our live show for naught. We'll see, but we will have a live show for you. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Please give us a, a like, a thumbs up, a subscribe, share this with all your friends, anywhere that you get your podcasts, you can get the Banner at Ravens podcast at Jonas underscore Schaefer is his Twitter handle. I'm at Paul Mancano. Thanks so much for tuning in. 